Here we go. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Okay, you are expected to read this out loud. Okay, all right, especially if you have ESV versions, ESVs. Here we go. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to secure accounts with his servants. That when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and, and, and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as, as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Heavenly Father, open your word to us. Do it for your own beautiful namesake. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Edwin, please go ahead and play the video that we prepared. Now I'll tell you when to stop. If I start walking back here, you'll figure it out. On November 5th, 2003, all doubt of Ridgeway's guilt was erased. He pleaded guilty to the murders of 48 women. He'd made a deal to cooperate with the prosecution to provide more information on his victims and the whereabouts of their remains. In doing so, he avoided a trial and possible death penalty. Mr. Ridgway, how do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder in the first degree as charged on count one for the death of Wendy Lee Caulfield. Guilty. How do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder in the first degree as charged in count two? Guilty. 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 It's like he didn't have any remorse at all for what he had done. You know, he killed so many people he didn't remember who they were, what they looked like. I just couldn't believe that somebody could kill all those people and not remember them. Neither could the angry relatives of his victims, who were invited to speak in court when Ridgway was sentenced to life without parole on December 18, 2003. That is sad. On virtually every level, 48 women killed by a man who didn't even remember who they are. Sad, Sad level, level number, number two, two, the man, the man had, had absolutely no remorse. remorse. Sad, Sad level, level number three, three the, the family's hearts, hearts are broken, broken and filled, filled with anger. anger. You had said your memory when it comes to all of the women you took was gone. Our memory is not. In your words, you said that they didn't mean anything to you, but she meant everything to us. She was a mother, she was a wife, she was a sister, and we miss her. Gary Ridgway sat there stone-faced as victims' relatives damned him and mocked him. He's an animal. I wish for him to have a long, suffering, cruel death. He's gonna go to hell and that's where he belongs. 
that is, that is just sad. Sad, 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 sad. sad, sad, sad. And, and you can understand their pain most certainly. But even for a man like Gary Ridgway, we have to understand the gospel. But then the emotionless facade finally cracked when the father of one of his victims appeared to surprise him with a dose of human kindness. Mr. Ridgway, um, there are people here that hate you. I'm not one of them. You've, you've made it difficult to live up to what I believe, and that is what God says to do, and that's to forgive. You are forgiven, sir. And so the video closes with that quote that we just read in the beginning of our our passage, and Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77, or some of your versions say 70 times seven, which is 490 times, for you who like to do exact math, okay? I thought that was a very powerful video how the man was absolutely unresponsive to the ridicule and the condemnation which I think most of us would say was very justifiable. And yet when, he, when forgiveness was extended to him, that's when he broke. That's when the tears began to flow. And there's a certain power in forgiveness. And uh, it's powerful because it's godlike. It's divine. It's godly. There's a, there's a quote. Um, there's a quote that is given that says, uh, what is it? To err is human, but forgiveness is divine, right? Err is human, forgiveness is divine. Even non-believing people understand this. But I want us as believers to understand it in a little bit deeper way. Jesus right now here is speaking with disciples. And this is to be the standard or the principle for discipleship. For people who call themselves Christians, people, or people who say they belong to Jesus, this is your standard of forgiveness. And Jesus says, no, not seven times, okay? I don't want you to forgive just seven times, even though that may be generous according to your standard, generous according to the world standards, but I want you to forgive 70 times seven or 77 times. And of course, he's not talking about 77, the number, or 490 for that matter. He is talking about having an infinite capacity of generosity when it comes to forgiveness. That's what he's talking about here. To illustrate that, he gives this magnificent story that we took a look at today and read very carefully. I hope you are following along because that's the background that I'm going to be going off of today. I want to talk today, first of all, about what true forgiveness is. What true forgiveness is, and then I want to talk about some reasons to forgive. I'll give you four reasons to forgive. But let's talk, first of all, about what true forgiveness is. Forgiveness is like time. If, you ask you, if I ask you, do you know what time is? You're going to be, you're going to be able to say, what are you going to say? Yeah, I know what time is. Can you define time for me? Can you describe it for me? Well, then I don't really know. Not to that degree. It's really kind of hard to put a handle on time. Forgiveness is something like that. There are many degrees of forgiveness. There are many aspects to forgiveness. And when you think you have a definition, you somehow, it seems to kind of squirm a little bit out of your grasp. So let me just take a couple of attempts at it. One of the books that I really like is called Unpacking Forgiveness by a guy named Chris Browns. Chris B-R-A-U-N-S. And if you want to read that book, it's in our library in the back. It's a very good book, a very thought-provoking book. And the way that he defines forgiveness is this. A commitment, look at your, pro, uh, your uh, um, program, over, it's a sermon overview sheet, you'll find it. It's a commitment by the offended person to graciously, to pardon graciously the repentant from moral liability and to be reconciled to that person 
although not all consequences are necessarily eliminated. Now, Chris Brown is trying to take a biblical model of God's forgiveness to us and then apply it to where we are. And when he does that, he comes up with this definition, a commitment by the offended to pardon graciously the repentant. And that's key, the repentant from moral liability and be reconciled to that person. Although not all the consequences are necessarily eliminated. Are you comfortable with that definition? I like it. I think it's very, very, very biblical. And especially when it comes to that point about repentance, right? Some of us can think very simply about forgiveness and say we should just forgive everybody blanket with a blank check kind of a offer, offering type of deal. Then where does justice go? Does God absolutely not care about justice? Biblically speaking, God cares a lot about justice. He cares so much about justice, he was not willing to compromise it, even at the point of allowing his son to die for it. But by his son dying for it, mercy triumphed over justice. He cares a lot about justice, but what he cares more, than, more, more about than justice is mercy. More about than his justice, he cares about his mercy. He prefers to give mercy then he prefers to give justice, okay? And in the cross, his justice and his mercy is satisfied. Justice, because for all the sins that we have committed, Jesus pays for that, and mercy, because we reap the benefit of that. Are you with me? That's clear, yes? Right, so this is how we see it. And so Chris Brown, says, Brown says, this, says it this way, then when we forgive somebody, we are not required to forgive that person unless that person repents. Right? Sound pretty good. That means we don't have to forgive Hitler. We don't have to forgive Judas Iscariot. We don't have to forgive a lot of people who have done a lot of hurt and in the end, they will receive their just reward, right? And there are some people, for some of you, it's very, very personal. For some of you, it'll be situations where you don't even have access to the people that have hurt you, right? Does justice com go completely out the window? According to this definition, no. Unless there is repentance, you are not required to reconcile or forgive that person. But then I thought, wait a minute. I thought that was good, and I thought, wait a minute. But how about for all those, all those times when we forgive, but there is no real repentance, okay? How about the thousands upon thousands of times that we forgive one another in the context of a family? How tedious, for lack of a better word, anal would it be? <laughs> If we required every single time that we were offended, waited for that other person to repent and say, so, say, I'm sorry for the things they've said, for the things they've done, for the things they've taken, right? Brothers and sisters, you know what I'm talking about, things they've taken, right? You just wait until your brother brings it back. You wait till your sister says something until you reconcile. No. And if you cover something like that with love and say, hey, we're family after all, is that not forgiveness? And if you say, well, we're family, so she can take my stuff without asking me for it. I, 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 if she actually owned up to it, okay, that would be even better. But if she doesn't, or if he doesn't, I'm okay with that. You let go of that because we're family, because love is more important. Is that not forgiveness? And I think in a sense it is. So I called him up. Hi, Chris. <laughs> hi, Chris. Oh, hi, how are you? I've been reading your book. I'm thinking about doing a project on this. And, uh, and I've got a question. Sure, sure, go ahead and shoot. I love these kinds of questions. And he said, well, what's, what's it? I think I Facebook messaged him, actually. It was going back and forth, to be, for, to be completely honest. Um, but it was a long time ago. And I said, in this kind of case, can it not be called forgiveness? And he did what he did not do in the book at all. He said, yes, I guess you could call it a type of forgiveness. But it's not the kind of forgiveness I'm talking about in the book. 
the full orb, fullness of forgiveness that God grants to believers who repent and he embraces them and brings them into his family. That's what we're shooting for. That's true for Christian forgiveness. It encompasses reconciliation. So I thought that was really humble of him and really, um, really great to have that discussion. So I'm thinking that maybe, you know, if we went a little further, I attempted another definition, taking into consideration his insights, and I said it this way, to forgive from the heart, because it's important that you forgive as a believer from the heart. Look at verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, he will exact payment for your sin, he says, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Right? What is that then? So that kind of forgiveness, I think, has to encompass the whole of it. The whole of it. All right? To forgive from the heart is to graciously extend the offer of reconciliation by either covering the offense with love or on condition of repentance, leaving all aspects of justice to God. Christian forgiveness, there is something to be said of letting the bitterness go and leaving it with the Lord from your heart, having a posture of forgiveness. You're open to reconciliation. And when that person repents, you will not hold it against that person anymore. You will not be bitter toward that person anymore. That's your commitment. And that can be done at any time, regardless of how the other person responds. And note the last piece, leaving all aspects of justice to God. Because God says, Vengeance is mine. I will do it. God says he will take care of any of the consequences. The people that have wronged you and hurt you will eventually pay for their sin. God guards you like the apple of his eye, the Bible says. You know what the apple of the eye is? I believe that's a metaphor for the pupil. It's like somebody taking a finger and poking God's eye. When somebody hurts you, he takes it seriously. He takes it seriously as, an, as individuals and as the church. People are persecuting the church right now. And there is a very dark part of hell that is waiting for them if they do not repent. If they repent, it'll be even better because they will become a part of our family. And that will magnify the grace of God, which is God's preferred method. But if they do not repent, don't worry about it. God will take care of the wrath part. What should you worry about? Guarding your heart okay. and forgiving and being forgiving and letting go. How do you do that? Okay. I picked up some steps to forgiveness from that same book. And he puts it down like this. Number one, resolve not to take vengeance. Okay. Second, lovingly and proactively offer grace. Make the offer of forgiveness. Make the offer of reconciliation. And that's a hard part, isn't it? We would rather avoid conflict, right? But biblically speaking, what has God done? He has gone out of his way to extend the offer of reconciliation and grace and forgiveness. And then number three, don't forgive the repent unrepentant. According to his category of forgiveness, don't grant reconciliation. The Bible does not expect you to be a doormat to be stepped upon, but leave room for the wrath of God. You don't have to be vengeful. You don't have to be wrathful. God is the one. Justice is mine. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Don't act like God. Holding on to that bitterness, refusing to let go. Okay. So I want to leave you then today. That's, the, that's what I have for definitions of forgiveness. Some food for thought, right? At least it's got you thinking a little bit. Now I want to talk a little bit about why you should forgive. Reasons to have a posture of letting go. Not holding offenses against other people. I know some of you have been wrong very, very severely. But what the Bible is saying, look... You need to adopt the posture of openness to reconciliation, of mercy toward people who have offended you. 
Because if you don't, first reason to forgive, unforgivingness equals unsavedness. Pastor Paul, did I hear you right? You mean if I'm, if I'm unforgiving, then I'm going to go to hell? I didn't say that. The Bible says it, okay? It says this, verse 34. And in anger, his master, after the result, after this guy would not forgive this other guy who owed him money, he said, in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So my heavenly father will do to every one of you. And he's talking to the disciples. If you do not forgive your brother from your heart, unforgivingness equals unsavedness. Pastor Paul, does that mean that if I don't forgive my brother, then I lose my salvation? No, it means you never had it in the first place. It means you never fully understood. You never really grasped what it was to be forgiven by God. You see, what was this guy's problem? This guy didn't really understand the magnitude of which he was forgiven. He didn't feel bad about it. He didn't feel like he was a bad guy for doing it. He didn't have any of this. All he felt bad about was being caught. What is that song? You say you're sorry, but you're not. You're only sorry you got caught. Does that not click? What song is that? Anyway, there's a song. <laughs> I can't get the exact lyrics for you right now, but the whole song says, you know, you're telling me that you're sorry, you're telling me you're confessing all of these things, but really you're only sorry that you got caught. And that's what this guy is. He's only sorry that he's got caught. And you see that evidence in the way that he treats the person who owes him a little bit of money. He hasn't come to grasps with how wicked his action was how much he truly owed his master. And because he was still self-righteous, there was no room for real repentance. Remember, God, when he grants repentance, that's when he grants forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration. So there was no true repentance on this, in this person's heart. And so from the get-go, this person never really understood what it was to be a disciple, what it was to be a person who has been forgiven of all of their sin. Do you see? So what's important, Sean? What's important, Margaret? What's important, Marilyn? Is that you understand what it is to be, oh, and Jenny, what it is to be forgiven by God, the magnitude of it. Because reason number two to forgive you being unforgiving, your unforgivingness is unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. You, as a recipient of God's grace, as a person who's been, who's been forgiven so much to withhold forgiveness from anybody who repents or any opportunity to forgive, it is just unreasonable. Consider how much this guy owed the king. All right? A person did the math for us, and it ends up being at least five billion, with a B, dollars. We don't get it because when Jesus says 10,000 denarii, what's denarii? What, that, 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 talents, what's talents? What, my, my gifts, my singing? Is it? No, it's, a, it's, it's money. It, and when you measure that, you end up with this kind of a figure. Look at the note that I have here for you. This is somebody else, not me. Somebody far more brilliant than me, or far more at least tedious than me, actually did the math. Look at this. The exact monetary value is difficult to determine because the talent was not a coin, but a unit of monetary reckoning. A silver talent was about 75 pounds, valued at 6,000 denarii. Since a denarius was the equivalent of a day's wage for a common laborer, and if we use the... 2001's minimum wage of $5.15 an hour in the United States, a common laborer would, 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 could expect $41.21 a day. A talent, therefore, would be worth approximately $247,200. Altogether, therefore, the man owes at least $2.5 billion. Okay? So, 
according to our minimum wage standards, which is above $10 now, there's twice this much, that would be over $5 billion. We're talking about national debt level, folks. Right? This guy was making a dent in the kingdom's economy. No wonder the king is upset. And the king says, I'm going to wipe that all clean for you because you look really sorry for your sin. You look like you feel really bad for what you've done. And I want to have mercy on you. And I'm going to forgive you $5 billion worth. Think of the unreasonableness of this. After this, he goes, and the Bible says he finds. He goes out to find somebody who owes him something a little bit more than $5,000. Something between five to $10,000. I know that's not a little sum of money. The first time I saw $1,000 in cash, I almost passed out, okay? I understand, that's not a small sum of money, and it's a lot for some people. But compared to five billion dollars, are you kidding me? Right? Five billion dollars. This guy should have gone out, found the guy, and said, forget it. Forget your five thousand dollars. I got a new lease on life. You can keep that. You can keep it. Okay? He should have gone to everybody who owed him anything and said, you can keep my lawnmower. You can keep my car. You can keep everything. Okay? Because I got a new lease on my life. Five billion dollars worth. But instead, it's as if he felt bitter that he got caught and goes out of his way to take it out on a guy who owes him some money. And the, the language is, is almost exact. He said, give me some time and I will pay you everything. That's exactly what he said to the, other, to the king. If, by, if he didn't get it until then, he should have gotten it at that point. But he didn't. All that is to say is to tell you, loved ones, how much you and I have been forgiven by God. Maybe the reason why you have such a difficult time forgiving other people, maybe the reason why you have a hard time swallowing your pride, going out of your way to be reconciled with people who have offended you, even admitting your own guilt, your own contribution in the problem, maybe the reason why is you don't fully understand or you have hardly scratched the surface of what it means to be forgiven by an infinitely holy God. What it cost him to do it. The cost of his son, Jesus Christ, his greatest treasure. God's greatest treasure is his son, Jesus, and he laid him down. He gave his life so that you and I might be saved for the debt of sin that we owed. And when you see that our offense against an infinite God is infinitely sinful. How many of you really need me to convince you that you are sinful? Youngest of you to the oldest of you, how many of you do I need to convince that there is something wrong in your life and you had something to do about it? But whatever that is, the guilt you've incurred, the Bible tells us absolutely clearly, clearly because the one you offended is infinite, that is infinitely sinful. And that deserves infinite separation from the one that you were created for. And that can be described, that agony can be described by nothing but the fires of hell. But instead of this, what does Jesus do? He gives you forgiveness. He gives you acceptance. And he pays. He doesn't just, the five billion dollars doesn't just go away. He pays for it. He, Jesus paid it all. Do you understand that? Have you come to gri grips with that? <laughs> I love this morning, I was listening to the sermon today and one phrase stuck with me. When Pastor Tony was preaching the last time, a, 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 a phrase that stuck with me was during the prayer and he said, um, I'll do, he says, he, in Jesus' words he's saying, uh, Jesus says, I'll do my part. And I'll do your part too. <laughs> what stuck with me this morning in the sermon was this. Shocked by mercy. I love the Korean. What I really like about, the, about Korean 
is that it sounds like what it means. 궁휼의 충격. Chungok. It's a shock. It's a shock that you get. Like, 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 it's, like, okay, for instance, it's also different when you say, when you say, when you cry out to God in Korean, right? It's, 주여! is what it is, okay? 주여! But when you do that in English, Lord! It's not exactly the same thing, right? It comes like from the kind of core of you when you can say, when you cry out to the Lord. That, it works that way in Korean, not so much in English. But the shock of mercy, the shock of mercy, shocking mercy. Loved one, listen to me. Have you been shocked by mercy? If you're a Christian today, there was a moment in your life when you were shocked at God's mercy. Maybe it was a moment when you discovered the, the depth of the depravity in your heart. Just got a glimpse of it. And Jesus paid for all of it. That Jesus knew every single sin that you would ever commit in your thought, in your action, against every single person that you would commit it. And he loved you and forgives you anyway. He chose you anyway. He brought you into himself anyway. In your sinful condition, he took you to himself and took responsibility and said, I will pay for that. You know that? You know that shock of, from mercy? If you do, listen, if you say amen, if you say you do, then you have all the resources within your grasp to forgive. You have it. The key is looking to all that you have been forgiven of by Jesus. And when you have received this payment for your sin, yet at that point you have, you have forfeited all the right to hold anything against anyone, right? After all, you should be dead. You should be separated from God. You should be separated from God forever in hell. And he doesn't give you that. If you receive so much in the light of that, how can we not be forgiving toward others? If God is so holy and so perfect as we know that he is, as even secular philosophers would say, if there is a God, he has to be the foundation of morality. If this perfect God would stoop and come below us, wash our feet, die on our behalf, at the cost of his life, forgive you, then what could be to greater cost to forgive and to be reconciled with somebody if God so high above us would stoop below us to forgive, what, a, what kind of a big sacrifice is it for us to stoop a little bit and forgive somebody on our own level? Right? Do you see what this guy did? The king forgave the servant. The servant refused to forgive his fellow servant. God so high above us stoops below us to forgive us. It makes no sense that we who are at the same level would hold anything against one another. It's unreasonable not to forgive. Are we good? That's the second reason. And third reason, forgiveness is godly. Forgiveness is godly. Forgiveness is godlike. Forgiveness is divine. To err, to sin in a sense, is human. This is our human fallen condition. But to forgive an offense, to go beyond the call and to be kind when you have been brutally offended, that's divine. That's God-like. That's Christ-like. It is Jesus on the cross looking at the very people, nailing him to it, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's divine. There was a song that I wanted to bring to you, that we wanted to bring to you today, but, but we couldn't because I'm just weak sauce and I couldn't learn it well enough. But uh, it's called, I, I would challenge you to look it up. You know what, I, I'm gonna put it on a, on a playlist on our YouTube channel. You can just, easy, just, just go to it, you'll find it. And it's called Forgiven by Crowder, David Crowder. And, and it begins with these words. I, hail, I held a nail in my very hands. 
I felt it on my fingertips. I've hidden in the garden. I've denied you with my very lips. I fall down on my knees with a hammer in my hand. What is that? Are you kneeling, begging for forgiveness? In a sense, it's included in there, repenting. But you're kneeling, you're kneeling to nail Jesus' hands to the cross. And the next line says, you look at me, arms open, forgiven. Isn't that good? And you look at me, I'm about to nail you to this cross, to this instrument of death, and you look at me and you say, forgiven. Forgiven of all the offenses, past, present, and future. In the light of that cross, who are you to withhold forgiveness from anybody else? Be godly. Be godlike. And when you have this opportunity, when your loved one, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your, your, your son or daughter offends you, forgive. Be forgiving. It's godlike. To use the older word, it's divine. And in a sense, divinity, not to say you are gods, but we partake, participate by his spirit in his person. You are identities to live out Christ's divinity. Do you hear me? Your identity is to live out Christ's divinity, especially when it comes to forgiveness. Will you become a more forgiving husband, forgiving wife, forgiving son or daughter, forgiving friend, forgiving enemy? Forgiveness is godly. And finally, forgiveness is good for you. <laughs> forgiveness is healthy. It's for your own good that you adopt this Christ-like posture of openness to reconciliation and forgiveness of letting go. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 24, it says this, that if you, remember, if you come to church with your offering, whether that's your life or money or whatever, and you remember you have something against somebody, leave your offering at church, go and get it right, and then come back and do the offering. What is it saying? That when you and I refuse to forgive one another, that gets in the way of your worship. When our horizontal is blocked, our vertical becomes blocked as well. There's a direct connection to that. If God has given you some people to love, and in this room, you have, God has given us to love one another, even if in this room, and it has happened at times, where people can't stand for people within their own church, so they're sitting at the opposite ends of the chapel. One of the reasons why this chapel remained this small, and we made it small purposefully, one of the reasons is that it would still be intimate, and that you wouldn't have a choice but to have to sit next to somebody. <laughs> Hopefully it's somebody that you hadn't sit, sat, sat next to for a while. When we can't worship, we can't love one another, it gets into our worship, it gets in, in the way of our worship of God. That makes sense, doesn't it? Let's take it one step further. I mentioned our spouses, right? Look at the way 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter, that meant, it says, says this. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker or fragile, as a precious vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, since they are your, brother, your sisters, since that she is your sister and heir with you in the grace of life, because you are one in Jesus Christ. Why? So that your prayers may not be hindered. When you are not right with your spouse, men, your prayer life suffers. It goes, with the, goes as, as well with the women, too. You know, when, I, when, I, when, when my family and I were on our way to church, there's always a little bit of a battle that goes on about the time. You know, timing needs to be good, needs to be right. We need to be early. I understand that, and everybody understands that. But once we get in the car and we're late, first thing we're thinking about is whose fault was it? <laughs> you know? And that can lead into a, an argument. 
I see some pastors smiling here, so I feel that I'm not, I'm not alone, all right? So, so it's very easy to, for that to lead into some other issues that might be going on in the week. And then uh, before you know it, you have a bad attitude. And then we are in an argument. And I'm about to preach in 10 minutes. Oh, man. That didn't, it's not what happened today, by God's grace, okay? But what I'm looking for, looking to, and for you to do is to be right with one another as a tool for being right with your Lord. Because if you, you are called to be one, display Trinitarian love between husband and wife. And if that's not right, if you're not forgiving, if you are hoarding up offenses for that one day when you get to blow up and shove it in your spouse's face, that's just not right. Let go. Why? It's for your own good. It's for your own connection with your Lord. I remember hearing one pastor, he said it this way, you know, you've been, man, you've been praying and, 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 and it feels like God's not been listening to you. Maybe it's because you've been, you've been mean to your wife. That's why God's turned his back on you. Dang. <laughs> you know? And I'm not quite putting it that way. But all I'm saying is, guard your loving relationships horizontally. And that translates into worship ver vertically. And it's fully biblical. And it's good for you. Look, loved ones, I care about you. I want you to be free. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be enjoying a thriving, vibrant life and love with God. That's what I want for you. Do you hear me? In all honesty, I don't really care about the person who has offended you. I care because I'm a pastor, kind of in a vague love your enemy sort of way. I care, right? But it's you I care about. It's you I'm committed to. It's you that I love. And it's you that I want the best for. And what's best for you is not to hold bitterness in your heart. It's, not to be unfor it's, 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 it's for you not to be unforgiving. It, it is said what? Bitterness is like a poison that you drink and you expect somebody else to get sick. Do you hear me? Bitterness, unforgiveness is a poison that you drink and you hope the person that has offended you gets sick. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So for your sake, for your Christ-likeness sake, for your spiritual health sake, listen, loved ones, all of us have baggage in our background. Would you today, let this day be the day in the light of your forgiveness in Jesus, to extend forgiveness to the person who has offended you. Maybe it's somebody who's just not around anymore. Maybe you've, had, you've, you've hoarded hurts in your heart against your parents, or your mom or dad. They're not even alive anymore. Maybe it'll take writing a letter, hiding it away somewhere, or something to open up your heart to the healing power of forgiveness. There are all kinds of testimonies of migraines being healed, of physical healing, emotional healing that came about as a, through the process of yielding to the Lord and letting go of bitterness in the light of all that God has forgiven you of.